Back in the 1930s, most of Gloucester Township was quiet countryside. Even Smith Road, close to Ottawa, was lined with farmland. One of the few landmarks along Smith Road, which today is usually pronounced Smythe, was the farmhouse of Thomas and Ida Saunderson. The humble farmhouse was home to the couple and their 13 children. The youngest child, John, was born in 1936. In 2018, John Saunderson shared his memories of life on that quiet gravel road southeast of Ottawa. John Fletcher Saunderson. I was born in Ottawa on July the 2nd, 1936. Always lots of doing and, and uh, lots of activity because with the 13 of a family and and when we first uh, moved out there, uh, well, was, that was before I was born, they moved to the farm. But, uh, you know, there's nine or ten, twelve kids at home all the time. <laughs> it starts off with Bill or William, then Marjorie, and Jim, and Herb, Dick, Mary, Willis, Stella, Alice, Amy, Rosalind, Helen, and myself. <laughs> As the youngest of 13 children, John heard plenty of tales of family life before he came along. Many of those tales were connected with the family ice cutting business when the Saundersons lived and worked at Mooney's Bay, near Hogs Back on the Rideau River. And then they rented a farm down in Mooney's Bay, right where Mooney's Bay is right now, the, was the farm. And uh, my dad bought into a, an ice business. I think it had something to do with the farm as well. But uh, he didn't own the farm, he only rented the farm. But he, he did buy the ice business. He cut ice at Mooney's Bay and uh, drew it into the ice houses. There was one ice house right on the farm. And the other ice house that he owned was down on what they called at that time Nordic Circle, which is across from Billingsbridge Plaza now. Mm -hmm. At that time it was a brickyard. And uh, they filled the two ice uh, sheds there and uh, covered it with sawdust and uh, then they, uh, in the springtime, they cut the ice into small cubes for refrigerator sizes or ice box sizes and my dad delivered them in town. They had a big circular, like a big circular saw with a powered gas powered circular saw mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, cut the right through to the ice. Sometimes it was up as three feet thick so it, it was a big saw. <laughs> The chunks of ice at that time would be about four feet long and about two foot square, like two foot high, two foot wide, or all depends how, how much uh, frost was in and how deep the ice got. They had a, uh, like an elevator type machine to, to pick it, it stayed, the bottom of it stayed in the water mm -hmm. and they pushed the ice up onto it and it grabbed it and shoved it up onto the truck. The uh, block of ice at that time, I think they said, would round between 250 and 300 pounds. There were several other ice cutting operations along the Rideau River, one being the Adams family business shown in these photos. Prior to the 1950s, when refrigerators became available, an ice box was an essential piece of kitchen equipment in all homes. But harvesting the ice was a backbreaking and often dangerous work. In addition, keeping the ice from melting while it was stored in massive ice houses for the rest of the year was a never ending challenge. They packed it all with sawdust. Mm -hmm. Drew the sawdust from the sawmills that were different auto like D. Camp Edwards and some of these people that were were uh, in the sawdust or saw and wood business mm -hmm. and they drew it and they stockpiled it and then as they put the ice in they packed it like the sides of the ice would never go out to the walls. Mm -hmm. They'd be maybe a foot of uh, and they'd put the sawdust mm -hmm. down inside. No, I remember the couple of the boys saying that when they were cutting ice, they'd step on a block and it, you know, slip out from underneath, and into the water they'd go. Oh. <laughs> and the funny part about it was, the, none of them could swim. Oh. How they didn't, somebody didn't drown is beyond my. But uh, what happened when they hauled you back out of it? There, my dad had a, always had a bottle of rum, I think it was, and heavy the bottle of rum and head for the house and run to the house, you know, because. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 
time you got a truck started and go on and so forth, uh, you know. So that was the, that was the deal. If you fell into the uh, the river, you pull you out and hand your bottle of rum and run to the house and get <laughs> dried up. The Saunderson family sold the ice business to the Cowan family in 1938, so John has no direct memory of it, except for one day in later years when he filled in at his older brother's job. I did one day, and, and I was only 15. Uh, my brother was sick and couldn't go to drive the truck to draw ice for Cowan's, and my dad said, you, you can drive the truck, to where you go. And that it was, it was the worst day of my life because whenever we got the load of ice on the truck, I look at the back of the truck and the truck's in a foot of water. So, so I'm picturing that the truck's going to sink and I can't swim and, you know, I'm going to drown here. And uh, Mr. Cowan said, just take your time and you get off the front of the truck over the hood and, then, uh, and get into the truck and start off very gently. Don't, don't <laughs> pop the clutch or he said, or it will break and go through the ice. And I tell you, the time I got that truck off the, off the river, <laughs> I was just a wreck. <laughs> the Saundersons eventually turned their attention to their new enterprise, their dairy farm along the Smythe Road. They moved to the Smythe Road. And when we moved there, it was called the Smith Road. Mm -hmm. And it was smelled Smith. And uh, somewhere along the between Gloucester and Ottawa transferring, it got changed to Smythe Road. And, uh, Attending classes in the one-room Hawthorne Public School was part of John's childhood, but schoolwork never took precedence over his farm chores, especially after his older brothers went off to fight in World War II. Well, I, so when I was nine or ten years old, I milked 25 head of cattle before I went to walk to school every morning. Uh, especially in the winter time, uh, because my brother worked on the ice with Kellens. He drew, drew ice for Kellens, so he'd be gone all the time. And there was only five girls between him and myself, and some of them started to work in town or going to high school. And so I ended up, uh, I'd have to get up early and milk cows before I walked to school. I remember my dad quite often at night he'd listen with his ear to the radio mm -hmm. what was happening overseas because he knew the boys were over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you'd, if you opened your mouth and made a noise when he was listening to that news broadcast, I tell you, you got, <laughs> you got told off pretty quick. But mm -hmm. uh, I remember my brother Herb telling the teacher that uh, when he came back from overseas, he went up to see her because he kind of felt that her Schooling really gave him a lift in the, in the Navy, and he went back and he said to the teacher, I circled the, the world three times during the war. John had to call an end to his education after grade 8, because his father, like many people of that era, failed to see the value in more schooling. The teacher was a good teacher, although I did not like her for the first seven years I went to school. Uh, she was a good teacher, and... Uh, she kept you busy. You was, there was no time to fool around, and if you got into trouble, I tell you, she knew how to handle you. So, I, my education ended when I was finished grade eight, and when I was, and that was actually my best year in school. I kind of realized, then the teacher was a little smarter than I was, and I kind of told the mark, and I'd done real well in grade eight. So I wanted to continue on, but my dad was not one for education. He had no education. He only had a grade three, I think, education. And I got all dressed up to go in and signed up for high school, and he said, get them clothes off and get your coveralls back on and get on that combine, you're not going to school. <laughs> so that was the end of my school year. <laughs> By 1950, life on the farm was threatened as the city of Ottawa expanded, taking in parts of Gloucester Township. Worried about the future, John's father accepted an offer made for the property by a young developer named Robert Compo. Thomas Saunderson moved his farming enterprise to Edwards, Ontario. His son John chose to get out of farming and become a mechanic. The reason he wanted to sell and get away from there is when the city annexed uh, in a Ottawa annexed into Gloucester for five years. They, uh, they fought with them and they gave them a five-year uh, timeline that they would not change their taxes for five years. 
Then after that, they said, they would figure out what they're going to do. And my dad was kind of afraid that after five years, if they turned around and paying taxes like they would in Ottawa for per lot, that he wouldn't be able to afford to keep it. So when Combo come along, he was kind of happy to, to uh, well, Combo took an option on it in 54, a one year option. The Elmville Acres development, now home to thousands of people, was built up in the final years of the 1950s. The site of the Saunderson farm is not easy to locate today, but the laneway probably started on the south side of Smythe Road, approximately across from the main door of Vincent Massey Public School. The family's contribution to the community was not forgotten as the suburb grew. Well, uh, Charlotte Whitten was mayor when, when uh, my dad sold the farm. And uh, she was, of course, a sister-in-law of Frank Rhines, And him and my dad were very close together. So whenever they sold the farm, she said there's going to be a Saunderson Drive. And she named the street after the family. In their retirement, John and his wife Shirley chose to live near where the Saunderson family had its roots, living in an apartment on Canterbury Avenue. John often marveled at how much the area had changed in his lifetime. You try to figure out where, you know, where the barn used to be or where was the house used to be and so on and so forth. But uh, it sure changed the landscape of the, of the farm. Mm -hmm.